Welcome to the next edition of Grid Forward Chats. I'm Bryce Yonker. Today we have with us Brianna Kobor. Brianna is with Google. Thanks for joining. Thanks so much for having me, Bryce. Happy to be here. As always, if you can introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and what led you into that role there. Yeah, absolutely. I'm our head of energy market innovation here at Google. I spent my career in and around utility rates and regulation and find myself at Google where I work on our new and innovative structures that help us to get clean and reliable energy to power our data centers. And you guys have a pretty significant footprint. So tell us a little bit about the top priorities at Google in the energy group and what you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, At Google today, it's all about capacity. It's about capacity both to support our growing data center demand, as well as accelerating capacity on the transmission and generation systems that are needed to serve that demand, as well as to decarbonize. And so I think a lot of folks have heard headlines that we see about load growth, and Google's growth is certainly part of what's driving that demand from data centers, as well as from other industrial manufacturing and and EV EV adoption. And I think one of the things that's really important to consider as you think about digesting these headlines on data center demand is that that demand's really an aggregation of the digital services that we all rely on in our day-to-day lives. So if you think about the number of times today that you've checked your email, that you've accessed your newsfeed, maybe you were in the car this morning driving your kids to school using a navigation system, All of those uh, actions that you take actually rely on data center services. And if we think about our modern economy, we've really come to depend um, at a a high level um, on on this this critical infrastructure. And in 2020, the US Department of Commerce found that the digital economy accounted for over 10% of US GDP. That's a number that we expect to grow. The same digital economy employed over 8 million people in this country. And data centers are really a critical component and enabler of that system. So then as we think about Google and and our work within that ecosystem, we think a lot about how to create the structures to ensure that our growing demand is really catalytic to what we need to see in the energy and ecosystem. And so that's both in terms of reliability, in terms of affordability for everyone, and in terms of decarbonization. So that's our our energy team focus. Uh, It's certainly an interesting time to be in the data center industry right now, uh, but also a time that comes with, I think, a lot of opportunity. We won't linger too much here, but there's a lot of conversation about that load growth, Um, you know, figures talking about the forecasts and what those could look like and the sort of impacts and maybe the questions on how we're going to serve it. what would you say as far as how we think about the numbers and maybe the a general range of the sort of growth that utilities are trying to anticipate and how they can serve serve the data center um, interest more effectively? Yeah, I think we are at another really interesting time as we think about that question. Unfortunately, utility low growth planning, like so many things in the utility ecosystem, can tend to be very siloed. And so if one were to take the demand forecasts of all the major electric utilities in the country and add them up, that would not be representative of the demand growth that we're expecting to see. I think you see a lot of duplication in requests, especially as we see access to capacity and those timelines get pushed out further and further. Major electric utility recently announced that it's four to seven years for anyone to get service on their grid. And so as businesses are facing that reality, they are understandably going and asking in various markets uh, for where there might be sooner access to capacity. So I think duplication is one thing to keep in mind. I also think that there is some level of speculation in those demand requests. And one of the things that we've been focused on really heavily here at Google is how to collaborate with our utilities to find the right structures that enable that clarity, right? And so to ensure that we are right-sizing the utility planning landscape We need our utilities to be planning for and investing in expansion of the transmission and generation system. We also want them to right size that. So with a load like Google's at the end of the day, we are burdened just like other rate payers with the potential for stranded assets. So we're really working with our partners to figure out how to provide that clarity. Uh, That looks like a commitment on behalf of the customer. That looks like signing up, um, making sure that at the end of the day, if load is planned and built for, that the customer is there at the end of the day to pay the bill. So I think there's a lot of work going on that uh, on that real time. 
And I'm hopeful that we'll start to see some really sound solutions emerge across the country that can provide greater clarity. Demand is growing. It is not growing to the extent that some of these headlines are showing us. Fantastic. All right, well, let's dive in. Uh, My first question is kind of around, maybe we'll call it aligning incentives. So how do we align the incentives of data center operators, of utility operators, and others as we drive towards the outcomes that are desired on building the necessary investments for our grid? Great question. I think that one of the main focuses as we think about alignment of incentives should be on the customer's bill. So just like any other ratepayer, our primary relationship with our utility is through our electricity bill. And so we need to think about the new types of tariffs and structures that by design bring those incentives into alignment. We've done a lot of work here at Google to think about how we can build new types of customer programs that make sure that our clean energy investments are accelerative of the decarbonization that's already happening on the grid and that are helpful with the transmission system build out. And so when when we look across the ecosystem, what we find is that the vast majority of corporate procurement and and Google alone anticipates that we're going to spend $16 billion on our renewable PPAs that we've already signed through 2040. But the vast majority of that procurement from ourselves and from our peers happens outside of utility integrated resource planning. Uh, We typically go direct to wholesale market and execute directly with uh, with developers for those PPAs. And so what we found is as we move forward in the decarbonization curve, as we move forward with adoption, significant adoption of intermittent renewables, we need to find the structures that enable ourselves and others like us to be investing in a way that's more complementary to what's needed to keep the lights on on the grid. Um, And so we've been doing a lot of work in that vein. I think the other theme of that is to make sure that we're bringing, to, to your point on aligning incentives, bringing those capital streams into alignment so that we are not in silos spending IRA dollars, in silos looking at utility resource planning, and in silos trying to meet corporate clean energy goals, but rather bringing that really all together. And I know you guys have done a recent partnership, I think it's in Nevada, so maybe you can dive in on kind of the nature of how you've structured that, and maybe if you see it possibly replicating what lessons can be learned for the wider ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, we were proud to announce in June of this year, our first implementation of uh, coming out of this incentive conversation, what we call the clean transition tariff. So that's a new type of utility program that is designed to align our procurement with the needs of the decarbonizing grid. And so we selected MV Energy as a key partner there because we have significant history of working really well with them. In 2019, we executed a solar and storage deal for our Henderson data center, uh, which at the time was the largest corporate procurement of battery storage. Uh, Battery storage today is old news, but in 2019 at the volumes that we were looking at really was market leading. Um, And so working together with the folks at NV Energy, we designed a new type of tariff structure that enables us to, in this case, uh, bring forward 115 megawatts of enhanced geothermal with our partners at Fervo. So that's going to be a new project on the Nevada grid. It's expected online in 2030. And I think what's really important to think about with the CTT structure is that it's centered in that utility resource planning. So the first thing that we did to develop that deal is we sat down with NV Energy. We developed a mutual understanding of what we expected their business as usual case to be in 2030. So NV Energy is doing a really fantastic job pursuing large amounts of solar and storage on their grid today, but we needed to find something that was complementary to that. And so uh, we have a a longstanding partnership with Fervo. We had supported a pilot project that they brought to the Nevada grid in 2021. And what we were able to do there is to identify that that resource could be really helpful. It can reduce commodity cost exposure uh, for other Nevadans on that grid as we see increasing gas build out. It can um, increase resiliency and reliability around the clock because you have a really high capacity factor of that resource. And one of the things to think about with the CTT and and with its selection of geothermal in Nevada is that it's not just a Nevada story and it's not just a geothermal story. Uh, Every year, Google runs a pretty basic looking IRP type analysis, basically a linear cost optimization model of what it would take for us to meet our hourly 24-7 matching goals by 2030. We run that model in two ways. So 
First, we run a scenario in which we only give the model access to scaled renewable resources. So things like wind, solar, and four-hour battery. And then we run a second scenario in which we give the model access to all types of new clean energy technologies, advanced nuclear, enhanced geothermal, carbon capture and storage, long duration energy storage, hydrogen. And we find that even when we run those scenarios at current expected pricing, we see a 40% reduction in our cost to achieve 24-7, as well as a 40% reduction in the overall megawatts needed. So I think that really builds the case to accelerate development of these types of clean, firm, clean, dispatchable technologies. And so as we think about the CTT, we're really proud of the work that we've proposed in Nevada. It is pending in front of the Nevada Public Utilities Commission. And so I'm looking forward to having that conversation with the wide you know, variety of stakeholders in that, that ecosystem. We're really excited. We're really proud of that work. And then we're also looking to scale that across the country. We think it's a really promising approach. And um, what's really critical to understand there is that it's the first type of utility program that instead of putting customer procurement on an, on an island, really finds that resource that's of greatest value. And then by, by centering on that value driving resource is able to unlock you know, greater value for the customer as well to bring these forward. Well, that example gives me a couple questions. We'll see if I can get more than one of them in before we go to some other topics. But one, one is around how do you all show up in a community, right? When, when Google invests in a community, there's a lot of expectations or, or assumptions as to what Google's operations might look like related to, to energy. How are you all showing up uh, in these discussions and being you know, constructive in the conversations? And how is the community wanting you all to show up? Yeah, I mean, great question. We try to be very intentional when we show up in a new community. At the end of the day, a data center is a large industrial facility. Folks really, you know, have a have a stake in that process and want to know what's what's showing up around the corner. How loud is it going to be? You know, how is it going to affect me? Um, and I think we're really intentional in communicating early and often with stakeholders and making sure that we're transparent in bringing that forward. From an energy perspective, which is where I spend most of my time, we're also really proactive in state regulatory ecosystems. We talk regularly with our consumer advocates in our states in which we operate to make sure that from an energy demand perspective, they also have the confidence that, that we're showing up. We absolutely all of the time desire to pay the full cost to serve us. We want to make sure that we're paying our fair share associated with use of the electric grid. And then when we go above and beyond, when we want to be pursuing clean energy options, we always want to make sure that we're fully covering any cost premium associated with doing so. And then my other question was around, do you have any other examples of Google really trying to dig in and scale a deployment, right, of, a, of, a, of an innovation that looks promising, but maybe on paper doesn't have all of the value potential realized or demonstrated yet. How does Google try to put some of those first deployments out into the market and see where we can learn uh, where, you know, economies of scale can really drive towards better impact as we move ahead? Yeah, that concept's been part and parcel of how we've approached our clean energy procurement from day one. Um, I can tell you that we are actively working on a lot of really exciting conversations, things around how we can advance grid enhancing technologies. How can we find a specific reconductoring project that's needed on a transmission system that might not be cost effective for the utility in their standard resource planning? And how can we isolate the need for that investment and and isolate that premium and, and credit for that? Um, onto Google's electric bill that also fits within a CTT structure. We're doing similar things with VPPs um, and with offsite energy efficiency. So there's a lot of really active discussions going on in this ecosystem, hoping to have something really concrete to share with, with folks soon. Um, but, you know, I think at, at a high level, it's really, it's, it's all hands on deck trying to figure out where those innovations uh, are that are needed and how we can play that role in furtherance of our clean energy goals and, and our need for growth and capacity and be able to find the structures that really work. Utilities by necessity, by design, we like it this way. They are least cost planners, right? Um, they have a mandate to serve all ratepayers uh, reliably, efficiently, and at least cost. And so 
it's difficult within existing regulatory paradigms often to push that innovation. So that's a role that we really feel that we can play in those conversations. And so we're trying to do that with a number of partners right now. Anything more on where the clean transition tariff goes from here? Or did we pretty much cover a lot of that? I mean, I think we hit uh, hit on the highlights. Uh, I will mention that we have also publicly announced that we're working with Duke Energy, both on development of the CTT, as well as a number of other things, things around load flexibility, how we can be using upfront capital to accelerate technology deployment. And, and we're really bullish on that conversation as well. Um, I think that we've gotten a lot of interest since we announced the Nevada deal, and that just really shows that it's, it's timely. Uh, it's a really important time in our decarbonization curve even before we start having the load growth conversation, but even more so today, as we start seeing those demand numbers tick up to be making sure that we can be intentional with the types of generation capacity that are serving this growth. Costly distribution upgrades, frequent extreme weather events, demand surging from an onslaught of distributed energy resources adoption. Do these challenges sound familiar? If so, you need Virtual Peaker's cloud-based distributed energy platform. We're empowering modern utilities with next-generation virtual power plant solutions to maximize the value of DERs. The Virtual Peaker platform unifies all aspects of DER management, from DERMS to customer engagement and demand forecasting. Learn more at virtual-peaker.com. Well, let's pivot a little bit. You actually mentioned it with the grid enhancing technology reconductoring example, but transmission is no doubt a constraint uh, to, to bring uh, generation to demand. Um, and how does how does Google show up for this? Uh, what, do, what do you think the mid and, and longer term uh, vantage points look like in this area? How do we untangle this knot and make some uh, constructive progress in this area? Yeah, that's one of the tightest knots I think there is <laughs> in the energy ecosystem. And so we're certainly, you know, engaged as a ratepayer, as an off taker. You know, we show up at the in FERC proceedings to talk about, you know, accelerating sound policy to help us to overcome some of these bottlenecks. The truth of the matter is that we need significant investment in our transmission system. And so we're actively having those conversations as, as well. Um, I think that as far as near term success that's Google specific, I, I would be focused on those grid enhancing technologies. I think that that's a place that, you know, you can even beyond reconductor, you can talk about dynamic line ratings where it's really not an expensive technology. It's much more of an organizational and structural change that's required of, of the utility. But you know, what can we do to push that along? What can we do to kind of finance and pay for that innovation and that I think will pay dividends um, should we get greater utility adoption of elements like that? Great. Well, here's one I really want to dive into. So maybe we'll have a few tangents on it. Um, how can demand flexibility for an operation like Google's, in particular on the data center, how is that something that you guys can look to bring forward and, and have a part, a more significant part of the equation? I think that there's a huge opportunity in demand flexibility. And when we think about demand flexibility, we think about it from a software solution perspective, not from a hard, not from a behind the meter hardware perspective, though we are also looking at investing in significant on-site batteries that can provide similar such services. But when we think about demand flexibility, we really think about running units of code that tell the various services that run within a Google data center, you know, maybe not right now <laughs> for that backup. Maybe we should delay that for a couple hours. And so we've been experimenting in this landscape for several years now. Um, in April of 2020, we first announced an initiative that we call Carbon Intelligent Load Shifting. Um, so I would call this demand response light, um, but it enabled our engineering teams to kind of work on these concepts that you know, you'll, you'll hear we, we're playing out at, at much greater degree today. So under Carbon Intelligent Load Shifting, what we do is we send a marginal emission signal across our fleet and uh, automatically kind of on the back end, and I want to emphasize around the edges, we are optimizing small amounts of our compute load in response to that. That's just to help us with our 24-7 goal. As an hourly goal, it matters what's happening from a carbon perspective on, on the grid in every hour. And so about a year later, we were able to take that work and then to think about how we could shift geographically across our footprint. We're fortunate to have a global footprint. And so what 
one facility may be constrained in doing, we may be able to run in another facility. So we've started to experiment under that program with that as well. Then came the European energy crisis, and that made us get a little bit more serious. And so um, in, in that winter season, what we were able to do is to schedule peak load reductions at our Netherlands site every day, cycling that site up and down in response to when we expected the grid to be most constrained. And then we've taken that and we've built that kind of pre-scheduled demand curve. And we have started to work uh, to a greater degree with utility signaling. So we're now able to get one hour notice and to drop significant megawatts on certain sites. And we'll caveat that that all depends on the types of services that are running in the data center. And that Google's ability to do this may not be indicative of what every data center could be able to provide. And so when you think about a Google data center, we both run our internal products, things like Maps, Search, Gmail, YouTube, as well as cloud products, which are products for other end use customers and you know, in their enterprise applications that they rely on. And so when we think about demand flexibility, we're always ramping down our own business before we're asking you to ramp down your business. And so we have a significant amount of that footprint that we're able to take that risk and that responsibility on. But if you think across the data center ecosystem, there are a number of providers that are, that are full cloud locations. And so their ability to do this kind of work may be more limited. That said, I think it's something that has huge promise. Um, and everywhere that we operate, everywhere, especially that we're growing, right? We're hitting constraints, to your point, on the transmission system. We're trying to engage with our utilities to have a conversation about, well, when are those constraints? Really, how many hours of a year do we expect to be experiencing those? And what might we be able to do to provide that flexibility and response? And if you can think about, you know, you rewind about 10 years, high load factor end use was really desirable for a lot of obvious reasons. Well, let's tweak that. Let's make it high load factor, but flexible end use. And I think you can see the value um, that there is in pursuing that. And if this is sensitive, answer it however you'd like, but are we talking about one or 2%, 10 or 20%, 50 plus percent? I mean, how much flexibility do you think a lot of these facilities have? It totally depends on the site, um, but double digit percentages uh, are, are something that we're working with across our fleet. Great. And you mentioned a lot about signaling, which is how I would start, but past signaling, are you getting incentives to, to flex, to flex this load from either your grid operators, your, your partner providers, or how does this work to make, to make it worth your time to do something like that? Yeah. Like any industrial customer, the first thing that our engineers will tell you is that they would much rather run their business and produce their product than they would to turn it off in response to an electric signal that they don't fundamentally understand. Um, and so it's certainly something, you know, that does have a cost to Google uh, to be able to run these resources. And so being able to provide those economic structures to incentivize that is really helpful. We are also in a situation with what we're able to provide doesn't fit cleanly into existing demand response programs. And so that's conversations that we're having, we're having at the RTO level and with individual utilities. So we've started rolling this out um, in Oregon and in Nebraska, um, as well as in Tennessee. And so in all of those instances, we've been in very close communication with our utility to make sure that there's something that makes sense for everyone. As we see greater adoption, it's our hope that we can start to see those models in the market emerge that can enable, I think, more nimble deployment of this resource. Well, that's a conversation I'd love to keep having. I'm excited to see you all working actively in it. Uh, as we talked a little bit about kind of with the onset of AI and data center demand, um, there's an increased load growth, but there's also a lot of functionality that's coming with being able to run new applications that automate better management of our grid system. So is there anything on either side of that equation that that's exciting you either, you know, how we better power uh, and supply these increasing load facilities or the capabilities from some of these AI solutions that allow us to run our grid more effectively. Yeah, I think we're just scratching the surface. And I think there's just a massive promise of AI innovation and how that can help not only in the energy ecosystem, but in so many different facets of our life. I think when we think about energy, uh, weather forecasting, uh, algorithms that help us predict on a really granular level, when you think about like public safety shutoffs, when you think about wind patterns, when you think about wildfire 
both, you know, mitigation and, and real time risk assessment. I think there's just a massive opportunity for us to innovate there. And talking with utility leadership over over the summer, I keep hearing, you know, the same story is we didn't used to have a meteorologist on staff. Now we have meteorologists, right? So let's give them the best possible tools that enable them to be operating the system safely and reliably. And I think that there's a huge promise for AI to play a part in that. In the broader climate perspective, there is also just massive opportunity. We were able with Google's models to run um, a predictive you know, uh, algorithm to say when an airplane was going to create a contrail, for example. Contrails are remarkably a major driver of global warming. And by changing flight patterns ever so slightly in response to this AI uh, signal, we were able to hugely reduce the global warming um, emissions coming out of those, you know, airplane contrails um, through a partnership we had with American Airlines. So that's just like one of many, many examples um, that our teams are really working on in real time. And so really excited to, to learn more from what they're able to discover. Great. Slightly different question, but it's similar. Uh, Google is an infrastructure company, but at your core, the culture of innovation has always been there. And that culture of innovation, I, I think a lot of folks can argue, it really isn't as present in the utility ecosystem. But what are you all learning? What are you sharing? Where do you see that culture of innovation going with so much change in the energy landscape right now? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, and some people believe we're an infrastructure company. Some people do not. Uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, uh, the internet runs out of data centers, which are large, boxy industrial facilities, right? And so when we think about innovation and we think about, you know, the opportunity, I would say that we're really fortunate that what's driving this increase in demand are these companies that can play that leadership role and have that stated desire to really put their hand forward and, and to innovate there. And, and I don't think that we should underestimate what that opportunity provides us. And I think that we always need to make sure that we are maintaining the really important role of the utility. Um, our utilities are not known for cutting edge innovation. And again, that's how we want the ecosystem. We want to maintain reliability. We want to maintain cost effectiveness. And then we want to find those models that, that enable us to innovate together or for, for them to support innovation you know, that we can push forward. Um, but I, I think that we're learning in real time kind of how we're stretching that system. And so out of great necessity, you know, should come should come great opportunity. All right. Our last question, uh, two sides of this coin. So usually start on the negative so we can end on the positive. Uh, w what are you more uh, most worried about these days when you think about the, the areas that are in motion in the wider energy ecosystem? And what are you so excited about? What keeps me up at night is timing. Um, and so we just have this situation in which we have um, accelerated demand curve that is meeting the need for new technologies that are not quite ready to meet that demand cleanly. And so I just think it is so important that we're resourcing to every extent possible acceleration, things like long duration energy storage, things like carbon capture and storage, things like hydrogen deployment. And, you know, a lot of these technologies exist. We've seen huge promises from developers, from pilot scale um, types of resources, but we really need to push forward and get serious about investment. And so that's also, you know, uh, obviously what excites me is I think there's just a huge opportunity to have an impact. We need to find those structures. We need to find those markets. We need to find those utility partners that enable us to push that forward. Um, but we really, uh, we, we really don't have a lot of time uh, and we need to be moving as quickly as possible. Well, Brianna, thank you for being on. Uh, such great examples of where you guys are leaning in. So much to learn for the wider ecosystem. Thanks for taking the time with us. Thanks so much, Bryce. My pleasure. Thanks again to our season sponsor, Virtual Peaker. If you enjoy Grid Forward Chats, please follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Give us a like or a review and tell your colleagues. You can listen to all episodes and learn more about our efforts to advance the grid at gridforward.org.